So today the order that we're looking at is the cryosolic order and this order was added to the Canadian system of soil classification in 1978 to capture all of the, uh, all of the cold affected soils or the permafrost affected soils uh, in the, in the Canadian, within the Canadian system. And so permafrost basically affects about 40% of the Canadian landmass, and so that actually encompasses quite a large, uh, large area within Canada. Uh, in terms of the overall concept of the order, what constitutes being affected by permafrost, permafrost refers to soils that are where their average temperature is at or below zero for at least two consecutive years, so there's, they don't uh, uh, thaw completely uh, at any point in that, in that period. And so it refers, in the case of the cryosolic order, depending on which of the great groups we're talking about, that permafrost has to be found within one or two meters of the soil surface in order for it to be classified as a cryosol. So unlike some of the other orders that we've talked about, in terms of the major soil forming processes and factors associated with the cryosolic order, um, it's a little bit different in the sense that the, we're looking primarily at, some, at one of the factors as being the defining characteristic of this particular order for most of the gray groups. So within the, cry, within the cryosolic order overall, we've got three primary gray groups, the, uh, the static, the turbic, and the organic. Uh, so they're differentiated based on their, on their parent material, uh, and they're differentiated as well based on the, the presence of cryoturbation. And so in terms of the, the processes that are governing the formation of cryosols, for the most part it's like we would see in, in any of the other soils. So uh, there's a lot of similarities between uh, many of the, the static cryosols and soils of the Brunosolic order, for example, in terms of the, the, the modification, the, the BM horizon being one of the, the, the defining characteristics of it. Uh, in terms of the organic cryosols, it's basically the same uh, soil forming processes that we would see associated with the organic order, uh, the degree of decomposition being one of the defining characteristics associated with that. But with the turbic cryosols, that's where we get into slightly different uh, processes, at least in terms of the, you know, the, the very uh, obvious manifestation of different differences in soil forming processes. Uh, in the turbic cryosols, we see evidence of uh, frost action, so what we refer to as cryoturbation occurring within the soils. And uh, that, that evidence can come uh, in a couple of different ways. There's, we can say that there's evidence of cryoturbation just by, just to some, in some environments, just by looking at the, the soil surface. There can be uh, uh, significant evidence of pattern ground, and certainly that's one of the, 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 the strong pronounced uh, uh, pattern ground that we see in this environment uh, would be one of the major uh, forms of evidence that we have of, of cryoturbation taking place here. In other environments, we can see really pronounced uh, broken horizons or displacement of the horizons. And so uh, unlike the brunosolic Br Br soils or uh, more in this environment, if we had, we're looking at static cryosols, uh, where the horizons would be primarily horizontal in nature, when we get into turbic cryosols that are influenced by cryoturbation, we can see these uh, uh, more vertical or uh, actually uh, completely mixed up horizons, so that being the, the, the turbation portion of it. So in terms of how that takes place, basically uh, it, it comes down to uh, the, the, what there, we generally see cryoturbation occurring in, in wetter soils, uh, wetter positions within the landscape. Uh, the, the moisture that's in the soil as the soil freezes, uh, because we've got permafrost b beneath and cold air at the surface, as the, the soil, as the soil freezes uh, in the fall, it freezes from above and below. Where the frost, uh, where the, as the, the first ice crystals form, basically the presence of that ice within the soil creates a, a hydraulic potential gradient within the soil. So in the same way that water moves from wet to dry or from upper landscape positions to lower landscape positions, it will actually move towards the ice. So those, this, where the, as those, once those ice crystals start to form within the soil, the ice uh, tends to, to form into lenses, so moisture moves within the soil forming these, these, these lenses. 
So the, the, that creates, a, in addition to that hydraulic gradient, so creating this, these differences in terms of moisture zones within the soil, we end up with drier zones, wetter zones. There also, that also creates a pressure gradient within the soil, and so we, have, we can end up with some squeezing within the soil, uh, the, the material that's not yet frozen. We can have uh, squeezing, forcing the, the, the wet material out to the surface. There can also be, uh, in the drier areas, as, the, as moisture moves towards these ice lenses, you can end up with desiccation cracks in the drier positions. And so those cracks themselves become a site where more material can be deposited. And then once that material is deposited, it becomes, uh, in the same way that we see in the vertisolic soils, as material becomes deposited, it contributes to further uh, um, argillipedoturbation in that case, uh, we, those cracks as they get infilled with other material can then become a site of further uh, expansion, in contributing to the overall pressure gradient that we, we see within the soil profile that ultimately leads to cryoturbation. In terms of the other processes and factors, uh, it's, it's very similar to what we would see elsewhere. In terms of the processes, these tend to be, uh, uh, in terms of additions, we've got the additions of, of organic matter. Uh, removals, there's not a lot of, you know, it is a relatively dry area, so there's not as much of a, a, a pronounced leaching regime associated with these soils. Um, uh, the, the transformations, um, they're, sorry, the, the, the transfers or transformations, the transfers of material within the soil or the transformations from one form to another, uh, tend to be a little bit less pronounced uh, as well it, in, insofar as there's not, um, the colder environment means that there's, uh, the, the, while there is still a significant soil microbial population, it's not necessarily as active as we would see in a, in a southern environment. And while we also will see um, some movement within the profile, we, we won't see with the lower precipitation, that's not going to be, we're not going to see the, the significant leaching of materials and accumulation in the lower horizons like we might see. And similarly, the, sim, the, sim, the physical act of cryoturbation is going to mix up uh, any, tr uh, any horizontal transfers that, uh, that might occur within the soil profile. Other soil forming factors uh, in terms of uh, climate is obviously the biggest one, uh, more so than the than uh, the more so than the permafrost itself. It's the overall climate that, as I indicated, that is so important in these environments as a as a factor contributing to the the, the soil characteristics that we see. That cold climate uh, is is what gives rise to the characteristics of of these soil profiles. And in the case of this uh, static and organic cryosols. It's the climate that contributes to the presence of the permafrost. Uh, the organ organisms, uh, vegetation is key in this environment. Uh, it's uh, the vegetation that is here has adapted to the to the to the climate, and uh, takes every opportunity uh, to to establish itself. But it's also extremely sensitive. We tend to see a lot of uh, a lot of below ground biomass uh, here, uh, but relatively low overall uh, overall. Uh, biomass above and below ground relative to, to other environments. Uh, the, the, uh, in terms of the other factors here, uh, relief is a, or uh, topography are really, uh, it's really important in this environment. Uh, as I indicated in this particular ecoregion, we're uh, right here, we're in alpine tundra. If we were to move down, uh, further down within this same, uh, within this same ecoregion, we would be into boreal forest. So as I indicated with uh, lodgepole pine and uh, white spruce being dominant species within that, a significant uh, uh, amount of aspen, particularly in the uh, drier uh, areas within the, within the eco, uh, south facing slopes, that type of thing. And uh, uh, there can be in, in some quite warm, dry uh, south facing slopes, there can be actually be quite a bit of uh, grass, uh, grassland uh, uh, present as well. So that, that uh, elevation is really important in this particular environment. Aspect within that can also be really important where we tend to see, because we're in uh, this mountainous region, we're in the Cordillera, we see uh, the, the, the importance of south facing versus north facing slopes being very important, where the permafrost is going to be quite a bit shallower on the north facing, north and east facing slopes than it is on the south and uh, uh, west facing slopes. Now one other factor that is uh, perhaps less, uh, less discussed uh, in, in southern environments would be the role of, of fire in these, in these, eco, in these, 
in these ecosystems. Uh, in this particular, at, at the, in the alpine tundra like this, it's less of an issue. But as we move further, uh, further down slope and into the into the boreal forest regions, we tend to see fire playing a significant role in terms of uh, it, uh, it, when it removes the, the surf surficial vegetation that contributes to uh, thickening of the active layer, where the active layer is that portion of the soil that thaws every year.